So, um, just in the way of uh, some orienting comments and uh, what our intention is in gathering together and uh, how this kind of, these kinds of practices might help us um, live more fully, uh, feel more enlivened, live with greater ease, less resistance, less conflict. Um, we, could, we could say that um, short of enlightenment, we just like to have a better life. And uh, if you think of um, some kind of progressive stages, uh, before we become enlightened, uh, we probably need to become uh, good human beings. And uh, we could take a look at what is it that interferes with our optimal functioning as a, as a human being. So I think we need to, or I need to start with the dilemma of our ordinary experience and the problems that come from our ordinary way of knowing. Um, this series is called A New Way of Knowing. And uh, that was taken from uh, a, a quote of, from uh, one of Rinpoche's um, time, space, knowledge sequences. And what he says there is, in order to be another way, we must know another way. So there's some connection between being and knowing. So it behooves us to, to begin to take a look at how do we currently know things and are there other ways of knowing that would be of greater benefit, greater harmony, greater peace, uh, greater compassion, more love. It wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt. And if we can begin to recognize that to do that, we don't really have to give up anything that's truly of value anything that's truly of value. And so it seems, as we take a look at this at the core, at the core of our dilemma, there is a both a belief and an experience of a separate, solid self. And there is a belief that the self is an entity that becomes an identity that is separate from everything that it knows. So there's a self in here and a world out there. And the self in here needs to protect itself, naturally, because it's small compared to the world out there. And the self in here needs to protect itself, to maintain itself, and to perpetuate itself. And we've had a tendency to define that self as whatever that self possesses. So the self might possess a car, my car. The self might possess a home, my home. The self might possess a partner, my partner, my children, my possessions that way. But even more subtle, the self then possesses an idea, my idea, my belief, my perception, my feeling. And once, once that becomes mine, we have a conscious and unconscious need to maintain it and to perpetuate it, regardless of how much we suffer, regardless of how painful it is. It's mine, and it's me, and it's how I am, and it's how the world is. I mean, we all know how they are. <laughs> and they are a certain way, and they, they, sometimes we live with them. <laughs> and when we live with them, they certainly affect us. And 
life would be so much better if they would just change. <laughs> if only they would be another way, I could really be fine, but they are not another way. And so, and then it, it, it's really an interesting, if we begin to, mindfulness has been a, a very, very wonderful tool. It's not an end point, folks. But mindfulness has been a very, very useful tool in that we can begin to notice the content of the mind. We can begin to notice what's happening in the theater. And what we can notice there is that we have a, uh, uh, an interaction with our most beloved one. And we have a reaction to it. And then we leave. And then we feel lousy. And even though they're not around, we continue to be upset about what happened. And we begin to continue to think about and tell the story. We're always listening to a story. It's very, very useful to begin to listen to the story. What is the story? What is the story? And of course I feel this way. Do you know what happened? And whatever we're saying is, hap is not happening. It's just echoing. It's being reviewed. It's being rewound. And it's justifying us feeling lousy. Listen, I don't think we should explain why we feel so poorly. I don't think we should explain why we feel poorly in light of our history. Oh, do you know how I was raised? <laughs> I mean, if you had known her, you would know why I am. <laughs> so we can explain it in light of the history. <clears throat> or, and, we can explain it in light of recent events. And we get to stay feeling irritable, impatient, aggravated, annoyed, for very good reason. It does not behoove us to identify the reason, because the reason then becomes a justification, and once we have the justification, we're stuck. So perhaps we'll talk some about cause and effect, but certainly this is an obvious example of where the irritation and annoyance that happened this morning need not ruin the day or even the drive to the office or the, the, the walk. I mean, I think we've had the experience of taking a hike and, and um, wishing that our mind would take a hike. <laughs> but the mind keeps going and, 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 and we keep going over and over this and the thoughts that are going on maintain the emotional state. And the emotional state perpetuates the thought. So what we want to do, what we'll work with today, is interrupting that, that uh, loop. There's a, there are more pieces of that. Actually, we have a perception of how things are. And that, that perception, which is an interpretation, even though you know it's true, it's useful to recognize that the mind only has perceptions. And all perception is interpretation. And so we have a perception or an interpretation, which sometimes we find annoying, irritating. And that perception aggravates the emotional state, which gets the thoughts going, which then maintains the truth of how we're seeing things. And there's no way out. There's no way out. I call that tapes. T-A-P-E-S. Tapes. Now, tapes are thoughts, <coughs> actions, perceptions, emotions, and sensations. And these tapes maintain themselves. The thought I'm worthless, I can't face the day. I'm a useless, worthless person. Maintains the action of staying in bed, not getting out. The perception of the world as critical, 
and judgmental. The emotions of depression and the sensations of this churning, hollow emptiness, which maintains the thoughts that are depressive, maintaining the actions and the perceptions. And so we can always explain or justify how, what's going on in light of what we know. All perception is state-specific. All perception is state-specific. So if I'm in an angry, irritated, annoyed state, I see jerks and inconsiderate people and the government everywhere. <laughs> and that political party. And what they're doing to this country. And from that position, from that attitude, I continue to see that on television, on certain network television. <laughs> and no matter how I yell at that television, they don't change. <laughs> Just like our spouses don't change, even though we would love for them. You know, sometimes our spouses are a little bit like the television. They just keep on going. <laughs> so our, our, our work, our work is, is not on wishing, wanting, and hoping things will be different, but to recognize that all perception is positional. That we're assuming a position, and from that position, this is how things look. And they really do look that way, in truth. Ricochet makes a distinction between what's true and what's real. What's true is it really, it truly does look that way from this vantage point. Reality is that which could be no other way. If something is real, it could be no other way. So it's useful to recognize that we're always perceiving the truth of the vantage point. Every time I stand on my head, you look upside down. Every time. And that's true. Now the question is, is that real? Or is that relative to the position that's being assumed? And does every position have its own perception? And how state-specific, how state-specific all perception is, how our view of the world out there is related to the state of mind that's operative, and the view and attitude we have about ourself as we look out and as we look in, that's also state specific. So how I see myself when I'm depressed, or how I see myself when I'm anxious, or how I see myself when I'm tired, or how I see myself when I'm hungry, depends upon the operative state of mind. If we can begin to attune to the operative state of mind and recognize that whatever experience we're having is related to the operative state of mind. Does that make sense? <laughs>